short range technique. I would not normally fish it on big flats like that. I want to be able to hit little pockets and seams. That's the system more designed for suspension systems. Here's my favorite leader formula. Nine foot OX leader. Doesn't really matter what it is, but I like to start with a nine foot OX leader. Have 20 inch section using blood knot from the nine foot to the 20 inch section of cider. And off of that, there's a tiny little steel tippet ring. Has everyone here heard of tippet rings? Yeah. Okay, little tippet ring, and then off of that you have your tippet material. And the rule of thumb is this, the, the length of the tippet must always slightly exceed the greatest depth that you'll be fishing for that day. Because the whole idea behind the cider is that it's actually out of the water so you can see it. If you're fishing deep water, maybe six foot of water, and your cider and your tippet's only placed three foot apart, your cider is going to be submerged below the depth. So just think about that. It's just common sense, but you always want your tippet to be slightly greater than the greatest depth of the water that you'd be fishing for the day. This is a tapered leader. And this leader formula allows you, this not to nymph fish, but it can also allow you to dry fly fish. Cider materials, you, as you said, you can build your own using gold strand and fluorescent pink, or you can use this stuff called Yonsamon, which Cortland makes a better product now. It's just their own dyed monofilament. The reason why I like using these tapered leaders because you could be on a spring creek in Colorado, all of a sudden nipping turns down, dry fly fish, and there's some PMDs that start hatching. So what you can do with this leader is cut off your nymphing rig, and with that tapered leader, just add a section of 6X, make a cast to a riser, and guess what? Fish on. When the, fish is, when the dry fly fishing turns over, you can go back to nymph fishing. So this leader formula allows you to do everything. It's not the best leader nymph formula for nymphing, it's not the best leader formula for dry fly fishing, but it allows you to do everything without having to completely change your rigs. This is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about elevation and elite. Can everyone see that monofilament on the water? You see how that monofilament's kind of dancing? I'm not dragging my indicator or my <coughs> cider. I'm casting, I'm letting those flies settle. Look at the rod tip, I'm elevating. Letting the flies drop to the bottom, and then you can, you can just see how that monofilament just kind of dances along. I'm not dragging it along the bottom. That would be an unnatural drift. In this situation, I'm fishing a pair of size 16 nymphs with a 332nd tungsten beam. Not a whole lot of weight. This is about three and a half, four foot water with medium current. But just utilizing that elevation, that lead technique, I allow the flies to quickly drop to the bottom to get the lead. And that's the thing what we're looking for, the bow. Again, if I see my cider material, again, this is the biggest mistake, especially when I do the few lessons I do every year. But when I see cider material, when people are, are looking at their cider, and if their cider is looking like this, this is just telling you that you are applying way too much tension. You just want that little bit of a bow, that's all. And all you're looking for, that's it. Just that little touch. That's all I want you to think about. Just create a little bit of a bow in your cider. And that's going to be your cue. The one difficulty with tight line nymphing is this. It's, I, wear, I do wear a waterproof backpack, and this is, yeah. But the thing is this. Huh. Well, doesn't matter. We'll go to this one. Devin Olson here. What I want to do is I want to show you couple guys that were actually fly fishing. People had different definitions. You read about it in the newspaper, you read about it on the online. People always have these different definitions of check nipping, and for good reason is this. Before we went to Italy, I filmed five of our great anglers before we went to Italy, and we wanted to see what their definition of European nipping was. This is Devin Olson. Devin Olson is a master. What he loves to do is fish exceptionally small flies. He's fishing a size 18 a little beadhead bait is pattern, but he fishes such lightly weighted flies in his rule of thumb, he likes to fish his flies far enough upstream, cast far enough upstream, give his flies plenty of time to get to the bottom, and then he'll begin controlling the drift once those flies are on the bottom. People say, well, you can't fish can't see in dirty water. Dirty water, size 18, little beadhead. Yeah, absolutely, you can see flies. Fish have incredible vision. But Devin likes to fish very lightly weighted flies, even on big water. He's just an, a master, and the whole idea is that you have to cast enough far enough upstream, create enough slack that the flies drop to the bottom. But again, the flies are so lightly weighted that he never drags his flies. The current moves the flies form. All he does is just simply stay ahead of them with a rod tip. <coughs> Lance Egan here, he is the current national champion and is a pure master of efficiency. This is the whole premise behind the short range technique. It's a little physically demanding, but this is it. Cast and you're elevated. Just as soon as that rod tip begins going across your opposite shoulder, you pick up. There's no false casting. Just short pick up, cast and present. In pocket water like this, you need to think about this. In pocket water like this, you're going to want to use a little bit of weight because your drift is so short. Your flies don't have time to get to the bottom. 
So the shorter the drift, the heavier your flies need to be because of just how little time they have. And this is just one of those techniques that just opens up a whole new avenue. Most people just pass past this, go way past this water. They don't even worry about it. They want those nice little ruts. Very few people focus on those riffles or that, those heavy riffs. And that's where most of the bugs are. That's, chances are, that's where a lot of your fish are going to be. The rods and the equipment that we like to use are this. Anything from a 10-foot up to an 11-foot rod. Anything that can handle a 3 to a 5-weight rod. Personally, I like to fish 4 and 5 weights. Uh, I would say probably a 5 weight. I, I'm kind of like a, a one woman rod or a one woman guy. I'm like a one rod guy as well. I like one or two rods I can feel intimate with. And I can do dry fly fishing, nymph fishing, I can even do streamer fishing with. That's why I do a 5 weights. But guys like Lance, he actually prefers a 4 weight. And he is a, a phenomenal angler. It's like anything else, everyone has a preference. But long rods, and the idea we're using longer leaders, the longer leaders I was talking about, the last thing you want is to have any line leader on that water, period. The reason why indicator fishing often have to use a lot of weight or a lot of split shots is because they have a, line, a lot of line and leader on the water. So what happens with a lot of line and leader on the water, you have surface tension, drag. So what you need to do is you need to counter that with more weight. With this system, there's no line leader on the water. So you don't need to fish that much weight because there's no, there's no counter. Now here's the thing, as fly fishers, we do whatever it takes to catch a fish. This is one of the most important parts I want to talk about here. It doesn't matter if you're fishing lightly weighted flies, there's got to be a rule. Your fly line needs to be outside the rod tip or it needs to be in the reel itself. This is what we call hang or sag. Anytime that part of your leader, because most of the time when we're nip fishing, the rod tip is at an upstream or an elevated angle. So what happens is if you have any part of that fly line in the guides, that's what's going to happen. It's going to pull. This right here, sag, is actually pulling down. It's actually going to create a counterweight. It's going to pull your nymphs out of the water. So what you want to have happen is the line needs to be outside the rod tip or completely wound within the reel. You want nothing but monofilament in the guides or line in the guides. Does this make sense? Okay. Again, simple little things, especially when you're fishing lightly weighted flies. These are the things you need to think about. Reducing any type of drag. As fly fishers, we do whatever it takes. This is looking like a Jimmy Houston bass fishing show right here. <laughs> Look at that size of that fish. <laughs> a little French fry. Now Norman, on the other hand, we talk about elevation and lead. We talk about when and when not to drag flies. As an example, that this is later in the day. There was a hatch going on. Most of the time we like a dead drift. Norman, on the other hand, for the most part, he likes to drag his flies a little faster, what people really think about Polish nymph, and that was the, basically the beginning of this European nymph, and the poles would actually cast and actually drag their flies a little faster than the current. It was designed for grayling, especially the grayling like the polling, which had very soft takes. The one way that they were able to detect those takes was actually creating a little bit more tension. Uh, but as an example, sometimes tension works, sometimes it doesn't work, but in this case, bugs are hatching. So what you want to do is you want to move your flies a little faster than the current. So Norman is great at this, and what he ends up doing is just casting. He fishes slightly heavier flies than the most of the guys on the team, but what he does is he keeps the rod tip down low and off the side and begins pulling the flies faster than the current. The other part is this. He never points his rod tip. There's about a 90 degree angle. You can see there's the rod tip and the fly is about a 90 degree angle from the rod tip. What this does is you don't want to point the rod tip directly at the fly. With it. If, if the line is completely taut, <laughs> exactly. They're not very good at landing fish, are they? <laughs> but what they do is they create that angle, right? Kind of hard to explain. But when you want to actually create what they call an induced take, what you want to do is this. You never want to point the rod tip at the flies. If you create a point the rod tip at the flies, Eric, right? Uh -huh. I remember you're not too bad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you never want to point the rod tip at the flies, because this is what this is the biggest mistake most anglers do when they do this check nipping. They point the rod tip at the flies. That's what happens. When the fish eats, there's no I mean, usually gonna break off or you're gonna lose the fly. So one of the things you want to do, it's like wet fly fishing. This is why wet fly fishers always create an angle. But they always create an angle, and then they pull the fly. So when the fish does take, go ahead and yank hard. <coughs> the rod tip basically absorbs the shock. So when you're pulling your flies, and all of a sudden you start getting those short little hits, like the flies just, the fish get on and they get off real quick, chances are you don't have enough slack in that system. So that's where you just want to create more of a 90 degree angle from your rod tip to your fly line to let the rod tip actually absorb the shock. Again, little things you need to think about. Now you can see the size of the nets that we fish, we're optimists because we think we're going to catch big fish at some point in the game. <coughs> a little short line nymphing, but get stuck in the brush, that's why we also use 4 and 5x tippet. Short cast, begin leading the fly, boom. 
One of the things you'll notice with these guys, they never drop the rod tip. Again, they suck at landing fish, don't they? <laughs> but one of the things that you'll notice with these guys, these guys never drop the rod tip once the cast is made. As soon as the cast is made, the rod tip stays at that level where it be, continues moving downstream. As soon as you make the cast, and if you drop the rod tip, you are throwing slack into that system. So you need to think about this when you're tight landing. As soon as you make the cast, you begin to be, want to begin immediately moving the rod tip downstream. Like everyone else, like I said, different preference. This is Lauren Williams from New York State. He likes to fish his cider about six feet. You can see that cider. It's way up there. But this is a modification that they call French nymphing. Basically, it's nothing more than just a hybrid tight line system, but you're fishing leaders. He likes to fish a leader about 25 foot. This is, in low water like this, even if you have a two or a three weight line hitting the water, it's going to spook fish. So this allows you to present flash from 30, 35 feet away with a long rod, long leader, without having any line leader on the water. It's a short little cast, and often you're using softer rods because it's easier to cast these long leaders. Now what we're doing is we're going to be making this cast, and Lauren is actually at some point going to hook this fish. Drift, 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 there he is. Now we fish on hard fish waters. This is right above my house. We have these fish by name. Tim, I've caught Tim before a couple times. Tim, I'm not going to hurt you. Okay, I'm only going to the internet. Okay, there you are. <laughs> you develop this relationship with these fish. Now this, what Lauren just did there. Common mistake most anglers make. I'm not sure if you noticed that immediate movement, but this is a common situation. You're casting up and across stream. You're fishing lightly wave flies and you're fishing heavy water. What happens is, think about this. As soon as those flies hit that water, there's a couple drop-offs where the flies can eventually get into and slow down. But initially, with that fast water, that current immediately begins flushing those flies downstream. So what the biggest mistake, including myself, is I make a cast. And there's that moment of hesitation. You just pause a second. If you pause a second, just a split second, immediately those flies are going to be downstream of the rod tip because of that hesitation. And as a result, the flies are downstream of the rod tip, the fish eats, then your rod tip has to move this far for tension to begin to occur into the system. So immediately, it's just, again, common sense. So when you're in faster water like this, you have to almost immediately make a cast and make a downstream and just position that rod tip downstream of those flies just to make sure that the connection occurs. Because the biggest thing is when you pause, or if you hesitate, you kill. That's what they say. Same thing with nipping. If you hesitate or just pause on your drift in fast, fast water like this, you're going to immediately be out of control. So remember that. Immediately move that rod tip downstream in fast water like that because it's amazing how fast those currents actually move your flies. Just a quick cast and the rod that moves downstream. Just line leader control. Simple little things that we just don't think about when we're nymph fishing. The other system we can go to, we can go to an all monofilament system. It's borderline bait fishing. Yeah, I, I kind of understand that. But it's a far more sensitive system. And what we end up doing, not so much normal years, but in the winter time, when those fish are stacked in those cold, cold runs and those deep pools, it takes you a little bit lethargic. So what you want is a sensitive system. And with this monofilament system, you actually wrap the monofilament. The back part of your finger here is a lot more sensitive than the inside. So what we end up doing with this monofilament system, the, the English were the first to do that. They end up fishing with braid. They fish with braid for brailing. And what they would end up doing is they fish these 30 foot braided leaders. And basically they would wrap part of the braid around their finger. That's all. Just because that, that braid would be able to wrap and you could feel the taste. So they would just basically wrap the braid and cast and just keep their line in separately. Just a far more sensitive tool. And it's something that you can use in low or in cold, cold water. Just some of my favorite patterns that I like to use. It's a catnip. I'll be tying some of these throughout the course of the day. But again, going away mostly from brass ass. We have brass ass. Ian is a good friend of mine. Lancey <coughs> against rain or his little salbug. The Frenchie is one of my favorite patterns.